Can we praise him, church? Amen. 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 Blessed be his name. Beni soit l'Eternel. Amen. Bon Jay Benny, you. I had to go a little Creole right now. I feel the tongues welling up. When the spirit hits, you feel the tongues well up. Turn to Mark chapter 7. Man, <laughs> I talked, I talked to uh, Pastor Enoch, um, I think it was yesterday or the day before, and he just called to wish us all a happy new year and wish God's blessings for us. He said, please tell the church that we in Haiti are praying for you and for God to work here. I'm like, Pastor Enoch, thank you so much. It means so much to hear someone in another country in the world praying and lifting us up. What a blessing that is to us this morning. Amen? If you're in Mark chapter 7, say word. We'll start in verse 1. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they had come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And Jesus said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or mother, Whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things do you do. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Our title for our time together, first Sunday of the year, 2019, is You Can't Get to God by Being Clean. You can't get to God by being clean. My friend, I want you to know that that's good news this morning. Someone should have shouted amen. amen. You can't get to God by being clean. You can't be clean enough to arrive at holiness. You can't be clean enough to arrive at righteousness. You can't be clean enough to earn the love of Jesus Christ. That's the best news you're going to hear all year. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's go get some bojangles. I'm ready to go. I, I know the Spirit's already moved uh, this morning, and so I'm going to jump right into our notes. If you would follow along with us, what we see in this text, first of all, is that Pharisees thought they were righteous by adding more laws. They thought that they could improve upon their righteousness by adding more laws. If you recall from our series on the Old Testament covenants, the purpose of the laws of Moses was not for anyone to earn righteousness, but rather it was to point to the perfect seed of Abraham through type, shadow, and symbol. The law was never designed for anyone to earn right standing before God. No one could earn salvation by virtue of the Old Covenant, but the totality of the Old Covenant was a reminder of our sinful condition. It was not a way to clean ourselves or to improve our sinful condition. And it was a prod which pushes us to the promise of the perfect seed that would bless all nations. The law was not a bar of soap that you could rub all over yourselves to clean you up. The law was a mirror to show that you needed the perfect seed. Amen? Oh, let me tell you something. My little boy, Mayor, he's, he sleeps, uh, he's been sleeping in a crib, but it's kind of got not a rail, so he can step in and out. So yesterday, we wanted to uh, make him a big boy bed. So Roman sleeps on a top bunk, and we were going to put the full bottom bunk together. 
And so for the past two years, every time Roman climbs in and out, this thing squeaks. Squeak, 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 squeaks. And it makes Mayor upset. And Mayor gets out of the bed 15 times every night and comes and gets in my bed. Said, Roman's moving around. The bed's making noise. And so I was like, I'm going to fix this once and for all. So since I was disassembling everything, I took all the bolts out of the bunk bed. I said, honey, uh, talking to my wife, go get me a bar of soap. And so she brought me this bar of soap, and I rubbed this bar of soap all over the threads. You know where I'm going with this. And once you put, I rubbed it all over the threads, and every single boat, it would squeak on the way in, and then it stopped squeaking. And it'd go right in, go right through. And I put all these bolts back in, soaked them all up, and once they got in there, no more squeak. Man, they were squeaky clean. Roman, Mayor was like, Dad, you fixed the bed. Roman was climbing all over. It wasn't squeaking. Here's the thing. Soap could make it easier for that thing to hold it together, but the law never made anything easier for us. The law was not an ability for man to squeak his condition to get closer to God. The law was was what showed us that we will die if we face God. It's a reminder of God's judgment and His moral superiority to see our sinfulness. Paul makes this point in the book of Romans. That no man can gain right standing through the law. Because through the law we find the knowledge of sin. He says that Abraham, our forefather of the faith, was declared righteous before the law. And he was declared righteous through faith, not through his own righteousness. And so in this text we see the response. This is uh, uh, all caps in your notes. Jesus called them hypocrites. This is not the hippie, seeker-friendly, postmodern, lovey Jesus that liberals make him out to be. Everyone says, well, Christianity says you, should, you shouldn't judge people. Be like Jesus. Don't judge. Jesus judged everyone he encountered. And he said, you're hypocrites. He told the woman, call in adultery, sin no more. He told the woman at the well. He was like, you're not even living in right relationship with the man you're with. Listen, don't get it into your head that Jesus doesn't judge people. He's been given all authority to judge every person under heaven. And every person will be judged either in his cross or in his wrath. So Jesus is the only one that has the authority to point to someone and says, you hypocrites, you've nullified the word of God. I think if Jesus stepped into some churches here in the United States, he would walk into churches filled with man-made traditions, and he said, you've nullified the word of God by following the tradition of men. There's some people that cling so tightly to the rules that they've made that they've lost sight of Jesus. I've been in churches where they will fight over anything from the color of the carpet to the paint on the bathroom walls. And I'm like, friends, you know there's people lost and dying and going to hell out there. And we're arguing over the color of the carpet. Don't let the traditions get in the way of the movement of God. And the word of God. You see, it says that the Pharisees and the Jews would not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing through the tradition of the elders. The Old Testament law never said that you had to wash your hands every time you ate. Now, is that a good practice? Well, sure it is. Do you remember the fellow that came here last year? He had no arms. Uh, Daniel Ritchie. And, and, and he only had uh, legs and feet. He had no arms. And, and in Sunday school, my wife asked him a question. She says, I've got to ask you a question. She says, how do you wash your feet before you eat? And I know this might gross some of y'all out. But he says, I don't. Now you're going to say, wow, that's disgusting. But listen, he can't hop up on the sink counter and put his feet in the sink wherever he goes. So his body has developed a natural immunity over the course of his life. And he doesn't get sick anymore. So, so the thing is, uh, uh, in the history of the world, people didn't have running water. They didn't carry around a bucket of soap with them. Washing hands wasn't something you did unless it was like wedding day or unless you were going to some hygienic practice. People didn't necessarily, what you listen, you went and killed the game skin, the game put it on fire, you eat it right there, you're hungry, man. And so the Old Testament law never said there had to be a ceremonial washing before you eat. In Exodus 30, 19, in your notes, it said Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water. And now this was before they went to perform sacrifices. The only commandment given to wash hands and feet was given to the Levites, not all the Jews. 
Whenever the Levites appeared before God, there was a ceremonial wash basin before they went to the temple. And the Levites had to wash their hands and they had to wash their feet before they presented sacrifices to the Lord. This was a reminder of the spotless cleanliness of the perfect seed who would be Jesus Christ. When he stands before God, he stands before God without stain, spot, or wrinkle. He is the perfectly clean high priest. But this command was not given to Jews. See, what we see is that the Pharisees took standards given to the priesthood and applied it to make a dogma for everyone else, including themselves. And they believed all these extra laws set them apart and above everyone else. They believed these extra laws made them more holy than other people. If you could think of who the Pharisees were, they were like the people that uh, uh, promote Sharia law in the Islamic communities. Are you familiar with Sharia law? Sharia law is these Islamic communities where uh, they, they force women to wear the, the burqas where you only see their eyes. They force people on what kind of foods they can eat and what kind of clothes they can wear. Well, those laws, I'm, I'm not promoting Islam, but those laws aren't in, in the, uh, the Quran. But Sharia law adds more laws. In the same way, Pharisee, Pharisees added more laws to the Bible. And they forced people to follow them. They took a burden which was already impossible to meet and they raised it higher. The very laws which were meant to demonstrate the righteousness of the Messiah, they took into their own hands and became their own standard for righteousness. They themselves became the vicar of Christ, the substitute, by trying to attain the standard that only he could attain. It is hard for us to understand what life was back then and why this was a big issue. For most of the world, people didn't have... Uh, uh, running water so it was not common for people to wash their hands nor was it common that they took their cups and kettles and and wash basins and and rinsed them out every time they used them now think in your house think about how many of you have a, a water cup that you like to use every day you have like one cup right anybody 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 okay so so every morning here's what I do right beside the refrigerator there's a cabinet I go in the cabinet and I get one type of water cup it's a water glass I fill it up with water, and I set it, I set it right there on the, on the countertop, and it will be there all day. Now, if I'm at home, that water cup will be there all day. I'll drink from that one water cup all day. Six, eight, ten, twelve times. Fill it up for breakfast, fill it up for lunch, fill it up for dinner. That one water cup, because I'm not having to wash it constantly. I don't rinse it out or, or scrub it every time I drink from it. It stays there all day long. Now, think 2,000 years ago. Do you think they washed every cup every day? I don't know if they did or not. But the Pharisees made people do it. All right? If you're drinking water, you go into the well. You're drinking water. It's fine. It's fine. But they're going to make you wash every single utensil. Now, for us, we've got washing machines. You've got uh, uh, dish detergent. It's easy. But the Old Testament never prescribed that. Furthermore... The Old Testament law only commanded the washing of utensils if touched by someone sick or unclean. And Leviticus 15, 11 details that. But the Pharisees thought they could earn a higher righteousness by adding more laws. Secondly, Pharisees thought access to God was gained by ritual purity. I've said many times there are only two religions in the world. There is the religion which says that if you do enough good things... That if you're good enough, you can earn your way to God. And there is the other religion which says you cannot do good things, you cannot be good enough, and God has earned his way to you. Every tradition, every religion in the world is an attempt to get to God through how good we can be and being good enough, except for Christianity. Christianity is the only religion which says you can't be good enough, you can't do enough good things, and you can't earn God's love because he has come to earn his reward for you. That's good news, my friends. That is the gospel. And what we see in Pharisaic Judaism is that it was not prescribed in the Old Testament. The way the Pharisees operated was not what the laws of the Old Testament said. Now, there are some, as of late, most notably there's a pastor named Andy Stanley, who, who claims that Jesus was teaching people to no longer follow the thought process of the Old Testament because of the way he interacted with the Pharisees. That's completely not true. Jesus was showing Pharisees 
not to stop following the Word of God. He was showing them that they weren't following the Word of God to begin with. They were never believing the Word of God. They were never following Judaism. And so what he was saying is, look, guys, stop what you're doing because you're not even following what the Old Testament says, what the Scripture says. Jesus showed them that their religion was the traditions of men. Basically, he says, you have a false religion. You have a false gospel. You're hoping in your own righteousness, and it will only lead to wrath. And So the question is, where did all these extra laws come from? I mean, I don't know anybody who wakes up one day and says, you know what, I think I need extra laws to get to God. I think I need more laws to earn salvation. Well, maybe except for Buddha or Muhammad or Joseph Smith or a handful of people. But what we find is that the Pharisaic laws developed over time. If we rewind the clock back to the Babylonian exile, was when King Nebuchadnezzar came and captured everyone from Judah in Jerusalem and took them to captivity into Babylon, the religious system of the Jews underwent a change in its DNA. During the exile, the Jewish people had no access to the temple. They had no access to the priesthood. They had no access to the animal sacrifices to atone for their sin. So the question is, during the 70 years of Jewish Babylonian exile, how did, the, uh, how did they maintain their atonement or their holiness before God? And so what happened, since they didn't have the temple or the priest or the sacrifices, is that in the Babylonian exile, there was the development of what's called a table cult. And a table cult is a rules, a, a, a list of rules and practices that were followed around the table, such as the ritual ceremonial washing of hands, such as the ceremonial washing of utensils. It almost became like a religious observance based on how you ate how you practiced, how you lived. It was no longer what you went to believe in. It was what you could personally do for yourself. And this was how the Pharisees developed the tradition of the elders, passed orally over time. And these oral traditions went on and on with extra laws. So many extra laws that when they were recorded in the second century, it produced 20 volumes of what's called the Babylonian Talmud. Now, friends... There's 600 laws in your Old Testament right here. Can you follow those laws? How would you like to have 20 extra volumes of laws? See, see, there's another law the Pharisees had. Not only could you not work on the Sabbath, you couldn't even spit on the Sabbath. Because if you spit into the dirt and it moved the dirt, well, that's almost like you're gardening. It's almost like you're plowing. You're doing work now. I guess if you spit enough, you can plant a row of corn. Make it a lot easier. Wouldn't even have the John Deere around today. I didn't know that. But they had all these extra laws in the Babylonian Talmud. 20 volumes. Now I don't think these guys in captivity were trying to earn their salvation. But I think they were confused about the purpose of the Mosaic Law. If you remember, the Mosaic Law was given so that they could earn blessings in the land. But once they were taken from the land, the blessing was taken also. So it's counterintuitive to develop extra laws in addition to the Old Testament when they didn't keep the Old Testament to begin with. Let me say that again. That's important. It's counterintuitive to develop extra laws when they didn't keep the original laws to begin with. The reason they went to Babylonian exile was because they didn't keep the laws. They lost the blessing. They worshipped other gods. They were the harlot that, uh, that fleed from their husband. And so they get there and they're like, oh, we messed it up. I guess we need to fix ourselves by making more laws. Well, the problem is they missed the point of the law, which is to show them their need for the Messiah. So they made more laws. See, whenever we see that we can't keep God laws, you know what we do? We try to make other laws for ourselves to make us feel better. People will make other laws to attain their own standard of judgment. We'll set rules for ourselves that determine if people can fit into our life if they meet those rules. And if they don't, then they're not good enough and we don't let them into our circle. Because you and I are just like the Pharisees. You and I look at other people based on rules we have made. Not rules God has made. We look at people based upon the types of clothes that they wear. Uh, you know what? I love, I love subtle things that people tell me sometimes. I'll come into church on Sunday morning. They'll look at me and they say, Preacher, you got jeans on this morning. I'm like, you want a special award, Dr. Sherlock? Everybody can see that. 
But it's these, it's these little standards that we have set. Or if I come in, I come in, maybe I don't have a tie on that morning because I've eaten too much Bojangles in the week and I can't buy any new clothes right now, all right? Somebody say, oh, preacher, no tie this morning? I'm like, I guess your vision is good. Don't worry about going to the eye doctor. But we have all these little standards that people must meet. I've heard, I've heard of some churches where some young people came in, you know, shorts, flip-flops, and people say, you can't come like this. Listen, folks, some people, that's all they got, all right? And that's what I love about friendship. Matter of fact, we had a homeless guy come to friendship for about two years. And we worked, really, really, we worked with him, tried to help him. We did help him for a long time. He's actually, last time I heard, he's got a job, he's doing well. But what I loved is that he came in here, he smelled, he, he had dirty clothes on, but everyone still loved him. Everyone still loved him. Friends, that's what happened when the gospel removes the blinders from our eyes. It takes all our little extra rules off, and we see people as God sees us. We're all messed up. We're all broken. We're all needy. And that's what the gospel does. But see, the Pharisees, they missed it. And instead of seeing people in need, they saw people through judgment. And that will prevent you from loving people. Thirdly, Pharisees thought that the words of men were authoritative. Mark 7, 9, he says, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to establish your own tradition. There have been for centuries men who have developed their own words into authoritative scripture. And when someone does this, they substitute themselves into the place of God and they discredit the words that actually come from God. There has been and there continues to be a battle for the sufficiency of the Word of God in our culture and in our churches. Every Sunday and Lord's Day when we get up to preach, we are battling for the inerrancy and the authority of God's Word. You'll see preachers who get up today and they'll get up and they'll exegete a dream that they had two weeks ago instead of exegeting Scripture. Listen, friends, if we need a word from God, don't pray for it. Open your Bible and see the Word He's given to us. This is the authoritative word. We don't need to invent new words. He's given us the full counsel of his word. There's a battle for the word of God. There is right now in the Methodist church a battle over the word of God. And there are those who believe that God's word is authoritative. And there are those who believe that culture is authoritative. My friend, whenever we let culture dictate the culture of the church, we are seeing then culture as authoritative. Whenever we let culture dictate Christianity, we're bowing the knee to Nebuchadnezzar and all we do is promulgate idolatry instead of promoting Christ. If we ever let culture dictate truth, our God is culture, not God. This was the same issue with the Pharisees. They took religion into their own hands. They crafted their own canon of literature. And by doing so, Jesus showed they neglected the word of God. Imagine that the men who thought that they were following the word of God more closer than anybody. Jesus says, you're not even listening to the word of God. You're not even following it. Jesus came with a prophetic rebuke. You're not even listening to scripture. You've substituted your own traditions in place of God's instruction. And he gives another example of how they do this. You see, in Jewish law, it says that we should honor a father and mother. That's not just Jewish law. That's uh, the Ten Commandments. That's the moral law. It's right to honor father and mother. If the father and mother later in life needed shelter, food, clothing, and support, the law of God says that we should honor our father and mother. We should take care of our father and mother. That's the right thing to do. But the Pharisees developed a tradition that the son could declare his goods Corban, meaning holy and separate to God. So let's say later in life the father and mother were elderly. They needed a table or they needed a couch or they needed uh, some sort of uh, uh, clothing. Well, the son could then say, because of the Pharisee's tradition, uh, Father, mother, I'm sorry. I've devoted my life to God, and everything I have is Corbin. Everything I have now belongs to the Lord, and you have no ownership of it. You know what Jesus says? Jesus says, you've taken the intention of the law of God, and you've ruined it by substituting your own tradition. Jesus showed these men that man-made laws are violating the spirit of God's law and contradicting the intention of God's law. My friend... Every day, our life is a battle for the sufficiency of God's Word. Are we going to let the Word of God show us who we are and what we need, who is Christ? Or will we continue to develop our own standards of goodness and put barriers between ourselves and God's grace? As long as we develop our own standards of goodness, we'll never see our daily need for the goodness of Christ. We will constantly see ourselves as sufficient, as righteous, as clean. 
Well, I'm doing good today because my keto diet has been going very, very well. I was, I was impressed earlier because uh, our, our drummer's uh, out. He, he pulled a muscle, and I was over there playing drums. And my watch told me I've already met my fitness goal for the day. I'm feeling righteous already. Feeling good. But some people use man-made criteria for their definition of righteousness. And some people will neglect the Word of God and the house of God as long as man-made criteria are being met. That's why America is one of the hardest places to witness. Because here, everyone's got food, clothing, shelter, welfare. welfare. People don't need God. My friend, if we define our blessedness by stuff, we'll never see our spiritual poverty and our need for Christ. How much longer will those of us live under the burden of our own standards? How much longer will we keep making rules for ourselves in an attempt to be clean? My friend, come to Christ because that weary and heavy burden that you've placed on yourself will only wear you out. Only Christ can give you rest. I don't know how many of you made goals for the new year. Maybe you set some sort of objective that you wanted to obtain. I imagine already this week that you haven't met some of the goals that you've tried to set for yourself. Can I tell you that that doesn't define your righteousness. It is defined through Jesus Christ. And once we have righteousness through Jesus Christ, which comes through faith, then we can serve God and worship God. And you know what? If we meet the goals, if we don't meet the goals, it's okay because we're not here for our goal. We're here for God's goal, which is His glory. We're here to live for His glory, not our own glory. Trust in Christ today for hope and salvation. Let Him wash you, not the washing of a utensil, but the washing of the Spirit, the mind. Let Him make you clean. We must come to Jesus as unclean people or we can't come to Him at all. Will you come to Him today? Let's pray. Father, we see our need for Christ. We see the law and that we cannot meet its standards. <clears throat> we see the law which says, honor thy father and mother and, and Lord, how many times we failed to do that perfectly. We see the law which says... How